Good morning. Let's stand together and hear from God's word as he calls us to worship through his word this morning from Psalm 68. I'll begin and then we can all read together. God shall arise, his enemies shall be scattered, and those who hate him shall flee before him. But the righteous shall be glad. They shall exalt before God. They shall be jubilant with joy. Now let's say this together. Sing to God, sing praises to his name. Lift up a song to him who rides through the deserts. His name is the Lord, exalt before him. Father of the fatherless and protector of widows is God in his holy habitation. God settles the solitary in a home. He leads out the prisoners to prosperity, but the rebellious dwell in a parched land. When we gather to rejoice, to sing praise to this God, it is in part a warning, a warning to the world to flee the wrath to come. And it is a part, an invitation to flee from their sins and flee to that holy God who is willing and able to forgive. And it is part proclamation that we were all once spiritual orphans, rebels, and prisoners. But God, rich in mercy, he set us free. Christ has defeated every sin. And if that is true, then let the world hear it. Let's sing it together. All creatures of our God and King, lift up your voice and with us sing. Oh, praise Him. Alleluia. Thou burning sun with golden beam Thou silver moon with softer gleam Oh, praise Him Oh, praise Him Alleluia Alleluia Alleluia
the Lord. Or I like how Psalm 148 talks in specific of all creation praising the Lord, even fruit trees. And if you've ever had an apple in season, you see the sweetness and glory of our God who created all this. Yes, let all creatures and all creation praise the Lord. You may be seated. Well, good morning. I'm Josiah Bellflower. I'm the missions pastor here at Desert Springs Church. If you're a guest with us this morning, we're thankful you've come. Whether you've, this is your first time to any church or just your first time to our church, I'm sure you are going to have some questions. So you can email us at info at dseabq.com. Or at the conclusion of our worship service, we have a newcomer's reception where you can meet a pastor and some of our members. We're going to have refreshments, and they're going to go over what we believe at Desert Springs, and then you can ask any questions you may have. So that's after service. You just go north, and there's some signs. If you have kids, you're going to want to, if your kids are in um, our DSC kids, you're going to want to go get those, the kids, and then bring them back, and then you can go to the newcomer's reception with them. For the rest of you that aren't guests, we haven't forgot about you. We actually have two tables in the foyer at the conclusion of service where you can learn about two different ministries that we have. We have our Los Ranchos School Partnership and Grief Share. I don't have time to talk about Grief Share, so you're going to want to go just go over there and ask them questions, and they're going to uh, talk about their ministry. But our Los Ranchos School Partnership has really grown a lot over this past year. Our members have been reading to kids. They've been helping in the office. They've been helping teachers. We even, during our VBS this past week, we had kids, our kids, assembling snack packs for kids at Los Ranchos that have been deemed to be food insecure, meaning that they don't know where their next meal is coming from. If they go into their pantry or in their refrigerator, there's just not going to be any food at times. So we're assembling these snack packs to give to them to be able to ensure that they have food. So we have lots of ways you can serve, so you're going to want to go over there and ask them about that. Maybe if you hear of different uh, opportunities for service and none of them fit you, you can still sign up and you'll receive emails and you never know when something's going to come up and you're going to say, hey, I'd actually like to do that. Like last year we pulled truckloads of weeds for the school. Uh, but, but at minimum, we want you to be praying for this ministry, praying that we are able to bless the school that we're able to meet the parents to bless them and to be able to share the gospel with their parents. So please be praying for this ministry. Lastly, our deadline for our auction items for our mission silent auction is this coming Sunday. This year we are raising funds for a broadcasting station for our gospel partners on the Navajo reservation. And every dollar that we raise will be matched. So please consider donating your talents, like some people are donating babysitting or cooking. And then, or you could donate your treasures, like we just got a a mint condition Lego set to auction off. There's so many ways that you can get involved to help make a a gospel difference and uh, spread the gospel on the Navajo Reservation. So please consider doing that. Please join me as I pray for the service. Lord, your splendor is above all the earth and heavens. Be praised, Lord. Make your name revered. Use our worship service to reveal and cleanse sin. Use our songs, prayers, and preaching to draw the prodigal to you. Increase your praise through the salvation of sinners. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And let's stand now and continue in prayer as we as we confess our sin and confess our need and go together to Jesus. Out of my bondage, sorrow and night, Jesus, I come, Jesus, I come into thy freedom, gladness and light. Jesus, I come to thee. Out of my sickness and into thy health. Out of my wanting and into thy wealth. Out of my sin and into thyself. Jesus, I come to thee. 
Jesus, I come to thee. sing these words of comfort. Come sons and daughters sing, adopted through the blood. God sent his son redeemed, now the curse has been undone, now the curse has to sin and captive under the law we stood now faith has come and active our freedom has been secure our freedom has been secure heirs of the promise we will see our we 
Isaiah 55, 6 through 13. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall break forth into singing and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress. Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle and it shall make a name for the Lord, an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. Yes, our God is working. We may not fully see or understand all his thoughts and ways, but we can know. We can know that he is good and that he is right. God moves in a mysterious way his wonders to perform he plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the Oh 
us remember. Let us believe it. Let me remember my song. Let my heart meditate all night long. I will appeal to the Lord. I will sing praises forever. Let me remember. say amen. You can be seated. Well, good morning, church. To those of you I've not met yet, uh, my name is Randy Pierce. I'm one of the pastors here at Desert Springs. One of the ways that we worship our God is through prayer. So would you please join me now in worshiping him? Our Lord Jesus, Thank you that marriage is defined by you. It's your idea, your institution, your means of blessing two lives, and we are so glad for this. You make a man and woman come together as one. You join them in a beautiful and mystical way as one flesh. From this loving union, you make them experience your world in a fuller and more colorful way seeing life and relationships and the beauty of your creation through the personality, through the experiences, yes, even through the funny quirks of the other. You teach the husband to love his wife as Christ loves the church. You teach the wife to help her husband focus his heart on serving the Savior. But Lord, for some of us, the one is gone from the other. Now, Lord, there is an emptiness. There is an ache in our brother or sister whose spouse has left this world. Now the other sees through only one eye, and the world is not as full. It's not as colorful. The light has dimmed. Relationships are flatter, and the edges of life have become dull. But your grace, Lord Jesus, your grace is sufficient. Your undeserved goodness, it's enough for us to give thanks 
It's enough for us to worship you still. It's enough for us to keep praising you. In you, there is life. In your person, there is fullness and purpose, meaning and beauty. And so, Lord, would you use your body? Would you use this church to be the lips that speak of the Father's love? To be the hands and feet that work the grace of our Lord Jesus? To be the hearts that tenderly bring the comfort of the Holy Spirit? Would you use us, Lord, to reflect the deep and matchless colors of your character to the one who has lost his wife, to the one who has lost her husband? Would you use us to highlight that sharper edge of your grace, a grace that goes down to the deepest of hurts, to the darkest of places? Would you use us, Lord, to continue assuring the grieving one that your creation is still beautiful and that they would say along with all the saints that our Savior is still good still loving still wonderful and Father you know you see the children in our community who have lost both mother and father the first grader at Bel Air Elementary whose mother was murdered, whose father is in prison, who lives with her ailing grandparents. Lord, who will care for this child when they die? And the many thousands like her in the more than 100 Title I schools in Albuquerque who live with others, who become anxious and agitated at the thought of the Christmas or summer breaks because they'll miss the free meals they get during school days, because they'll spend more time with people who are merely caretakers. Our Lord God, you are Father to the fatherless. So would you extend your fatherly care to these orphan children? The need is too great, Lord. The numbers are too many. But you don't call us to meet you don't call each of us to meet these needs, but to see the person in front of us, the one made in your image, whom you have sovereignly caused to cross our paths. Lord, open our eyes to see the opportunities, even this week, to love that one you call our neighbor, to bring comfort physically, emotionally, and spiritually to these little ones who are hurting Lord, do that, and let us bring your love, your goodness, your comfort to the widow, to the widower, to the orphan, and to the poor. We thank you, Lord, that we call you Father, and we do that through and by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us stand now, rejoice in our privilege of prayer and our friendship with Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus All our sins and griefs to bear What a privilege to carry Everything to God in prayer We often forfeit all what needless pain we bear, all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Have we tried? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so fair?
Yes, Heavenly Father, what a privilege that we can come to you in prayer, that we can ask, that we can seek, that we can knock, and that you will answer us, because you have made us your children through Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, we come and we ask that you would help us this morning to hear from your word, your word that will not return void. God, we pray that you would open up our ears, that you would open up our hearts to understand your word, and and that you would pardon us for our sins through Christ. Lord, I pray that if there is anyone in this room who is right now a spiritual orphan, who has not yet repented of their sins and believed in you, who is not yet able to call you Father, Lord, we pray that even this morning you would adopt them, that they would believe in your Son, Jesus Christ, and become a child of God with him. We ask this for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning, church. If you've got a Bible, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 7 this morning, so please turn there. If you don't have a Bible, we'll have these words up on the screen behind me. If I've not met you before, my name's Chase Jacobs. I'm the executive pastor here at Desert Springs, and we're continuing in this series through the gospel according to Matthew. We're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 12 this morning. As we'll see, there's a lot, uh, a lot of ground that we have to cover in this. I could have preached four sermons out of this section, but instead we're going to do it all, all together, and there's some wisdom in that, so, um, but we, we definitely need the Lord's help as we study this passage together. So is everybody there, Matthew chapter 7? All right. I'm going to take that as a yes, that kind of quiet mumble that I heard that everybody's there. Here we go. Matthew chapter 7. We're starting verse 1. The Lord Jesus says, Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is the log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. For which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? So... Whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. That's the word of the Lord. So it's been said that Matthew chapter 7 verse 1 is our culture's favorite Bible verse. Do not judge. And that does seem to capture the spirit of our age, doesn't it? After all, who are you to question someone else's beliefs? And how dare you criticize someone else for their choices or their lifestyle? Do not judge. Or a lot of times people will say it in the King James Version, won't they? Judge not lest ye be judged yourself. Kind of adds that air of authenticity to it when when our culture quotes this Bible verse to us. Because it may be the world's most popular Bible verse, but I think it's also probably the most misunderstood Even faithful Christians, when they consider this verse out of context, can become really confused by it. Don't judge. How are we supposed to share the gospel with someone? 
if we're not supposed to judge them. Because you can't tell someone that Jesus died on the cross for their sins if it would be judgmental to tell them that they sinned in the first place. And so how are we supposed to obey this command of Jesus not to judge? What do we do? Well, I think much of that misunderstanding comes from our narrow American understanding of what the word to judge actually means. We take that word very narrowly to mean just something like to condemn unfairly. To judge someone else is to condemn them unfairly. But actually the word to judge has a lot of meanings. It can mean to discern something. It can mean to evaluate something. It can mean to make a decision. A decision between two things. Between something that is wise and something that is foolish. Between something that is better and something that is best. And yes, even to decide between something that is good and something that is bad. But we all make judgments all the time. We have to in this world. And we even make moral judgments. Actually, even to say you should not judge others is itself a moral statement, isn't it? After all, what you're saying is that it is wrong for you to tell someone else that they are wrong. Well, then isn't that wrong? Aren't you judging someone else for judging? What, what are we supposed to do here? No, we need a more nuanced understanding of what Jesus means in Matthew 7, verse 1, when he says, judge not. And actually, even from the context of this whole passage, if we were to read all of what Jesus says here, not just take this little verse out of context, if we looked at everything that Jesus says, then even then we would see that Jesus cannot have in mind here an absolute prohibition on making any kind of judgment, evaluation of anybody else at any time ever. He can't mean that because even in verse 6 of our passage, Jesus tells us not to give holy things to people that he calls dogs and pigs. Or if we kept on reading in verse 15, Jesus is going to tell us to beware of false teachers and false disciples. And he says that we will know who are these false teachers by evaluating their works, by the fruit in their own life. Well, certainly that takes judgment, doesn't it? We have to make a judgment of someone else in order to know whether or not they are a false teacher. So for Jesus telling us in verse 1 not to judge others, he sure goes on to talk an awful lot about judgment. Actually, many scholars would say that the whole big idea of Matthew chapter 7 is judgment. That's the big theme in Matthew 7. This text is actually all about how to judge others. Or more specifically, it's about how to judge others rightly. That's what this passage is calling us to this morning. We all must make judgments in life, especially as Christians. In fact, God made us to be judges. God made all mankind to have dominion, to rule over this world that he gave us. And a big part of having dominion and ruling is making judgments, making decisions about what is right and wrong. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 6 says that Christians will one day judge angels. Part of being made in the image of God and having this right moral sense is that we are made to judge. But we can judge wrongly and sinfully. And with devastating consequences. Or we can judge rightly with a right judgment that reflects God's judgment. And when we do that, it brings about justice and righteousness and grace in the whole world. So we are to judge rightly. And the question is, well, how in the world do we do that? How do we judge others rightly? Well, that's what we're looking at this morning. In verses 1 through 12, we'll see that this passage can break up into four big sections, which you have in your outline. And each of those sections has either a very clear prohibition, a negative command, or it has a very clear positive command. And so our outline this morning is just going to go through these four different commands. And first, we're going to start in verses 1 through 5 with this command, don't judge others hypocritically. So this is our first point, verses 1 through 5. Don't judge others, how? Hypocritically. And you say, well, where do you get that word hypocritically? Because in verse 1, Jesus just says, don't judge. Look down at verse 5. How does verse 5 start? You hypocrite. 
So that's who Jesus is talking to in this section. This is who Jesus has in view here. Hypocrites. This is actually in view of the larger conversation that started all the way back in chapter 6. Do you remember this? Alex preached a whole sermon about, about hip, hypocrisy and what that means about these, these religious leaders who were practicing their faith ostentatiously so that they would receive glory from other people. And there in that sermon, Alex, I think, gave a really helpful definition of what hypocrisy is. Contrary to kind of how we think about it today, that we think a hypocrite is someone whose talk doesn't line up with their walk, Alex said, actually, a hypocrite in the Bible is someone whose walk does not line up with their heart. That however good they look on the outside, they might even be doing things that God would say are good, except they're doing it with the wrong motives. They're doing it with the wrong heart. That is hypocrisy. And that is what Jesus has in view here, that he is saying and warning us against, just like he was warning against hypocritical prayer and hypocritical fasting and hypocritical giving, that now he's warning us against hypocritical judging. And we can identify hypocritical judging versus right judging in two primary ways. So these are the two ways that you know if someone or if you yourself are judging hypocritically. One is that you're doing it with the wrong heart, And two is that you are doing it according to the wrong standard. So that is how we define hypocritical judging. It's with the wrong heart and by the wrong standard. So first it's done with the wrong heart and that it's all about you. That's why you're making the judgments. Your your heart, in your heart, your desire is not to glorify your father who sees in secret. Your heart is to glorify yourself. And your heart is not to love this other person that you are judging, whether publicly or just in your own estimation of them, but you are actually trying to tear them down. You are trying to bring them down, make them seem worse so that you seem better. But your motive is not their good, it's your own glory. That is hypocritical judging. That is with a wrong heart. And we judge also hypocritically when we judge with a wrong standard. So what is the standard that we are supposed to judge someone according to? What is the standard by which we know what is right and what is wrong? Is it whatever we think is right or wrong? Is it whatever the culture says is right or wrong? No, it is whatever God says is right or wrong. So this is our standard by which we are evaluating everything. And to judge hypocritically is to not judge by this standard, but it's to judge by your own standard. It's to judge by your own standard by going beyond what this says often. We judge hypocritically when we go beyond what the Bible says and we judge other people for not conforming to our own man-made traditions. They don't do that the way that we have always done it. Or we judge other people hypocritically when we, we, we judge them by the wrong standard, when we say that they are not up to date on, on the latest cultural trend or the latest cultural sensitivity, the thing that we all know now is the right side of history and this is how we should talk because this is how all good people talk holding them to that standard, the world's standard. We're holding them to our own standard when we judge them according even to good principles that are derived from the Bible and yet are still conscience-level issues. They're things that you might be really convicted about, but that God's word is not perfectly clear on, so there's room for Christians to disagree. When you are holding someone to the standard of your own conscience rather than what is clearly said in Scripture, you are judging them hypocritically by going beyond the standard of God's word. So we can go beyond the standard of God's word to judge someone hypocritically. We can also go uh, beneath the standard of God's word. We can say less than what God's word says and judge hypocritically. And by that, I mean that you're being selective in what parts of the Bible you're actually applying to somebody else. You're not judging someone else according to the whole counsel of God. You're only judging them according to the parts of God's word that you yourself do really well. And we do this all the time, don't we? We know what parts of the Bible that we've got down. We know what commands that we've obeyed really well lately. And we're really quick to judge other people according to those commands. Because they're not doing it, but I am. But isn't it amazing how often we leave out all the parts of the Bible that would condemn us if we held ourselves to the same standard that we're holding them? We are saying less than God's word. We're not saying everything because we know if we, if we judged that person according to that Bible verse well, then we'd be judged right along with them. And we can't have that because the whole point is our own glory. But that's actually the point. This is what Jesus is getting at, that we are all included in the same judgment. And when you say too much, 
or you say not enough, you are forgetting what judgment actually is. That's why Jesus is this, this basis that he gives us in verse 1. Look at this. Look again at verse 1. He says, judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use it, it will be measured to you. This is a principle that Jesus has already brought up in the Sermon on the Mount. You go back to chapter 6, verse 14. There Jesus says, If you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So how we treat others has to do with our relationship with God. Now what Jesus is not saying is that this is some kind of divine quid pro quo or this for that. Like all of our forgiveness is just based on our being forgiving to other people. Or that if we will want to come out from under God's judgment, all we have to do is not judge other people. Okay, that's not what Jesus is saying here. That would actually be works righteousness. That's not the gospel, okay? What Jesus is saying is that if you are unforgiving, if that you go on judging other people for your own righteousness' sake, then you probably don't understand the grace that God has shown you in the gospel, which may mean that you have not yet been forgiven yourself, that you don't understand what God has done for you in the gospel of Jesus Christ, or, or if you did understand it, you would never treat somebody else that way. Another very common expression in our culture is, only God can judge me. Have you ever heard someone say this? For some reason, it is a very popular tattoo. But I wonder if people who say this or get it tattooed on their body, if they actually believe that, that God will judge them. Verse 2 reminds us that, yes, we will be judged with a judgment that is not from man, but a judgment that is from God, and that should be a terrifying thought. We all will stand one day before the judgment seat of God. And in that day, all of us will be laid bare. None of us will have any of our faults hidden anymore. God will see every sin in your life, every wrong that you have committed, everything that you have, every way that you have fallen short. And in that day, we will not be able to compare ourselves to other people. We won't be able to say, well, I was at least better than this guy. That's not how it works. Only God can judge you, and he will. And were it not for Christ, as we stand before God according to his standard, we would all be condemned. But God forgives us. God has made a way for us to come out from underneath that judgment by giving his very own son. Jesus Christ, who was alone without sin. Jesus Christ, who alone could stand before the judgment seat of God and not be afraid because he had never done anything wrong. God could search Jesus inside and out and find no speck of sin, no fault whatsoever. Jesus was perfect, and Jesus was condemned in our place Jesus underwent our judgment. So the cross of Christ is that final judgment that we will all face when we stand before the judgment seat of God that traveled back in time and was poured out on God's Son on the cross so that when we stand there in that day, all of the judgment will already have been paid for. All of the condemnation that we will deserve, it will have already happened on the cross of Jesus Christ because Jesus died in your place as a substitute for your sins. And not only did he die, but he was raised. And do you know what that means? It means that it worked. It means that all of the condemnation was completely absorbed and swallowed up. And Christ still had life and righteousness left that he could walk right out of the tomb. And now, just like Jesus walks before the throne of the Father in total confidence, we can too. Because we are in Christ, and Christ's righteousness has been given to us. And so now when God looks at us, those of us who have believed in Jesus, just like God searches Jesus in and out and finds no fault, that's how God looks at us. Isn't that amazing? There's no sin in us because of Christ. That is how God views us. And if you're not a Christian, if you haven't believed in Jesus, don't you want that? Don't you know that there's a creator God? 
Don't you know that you have not obeyed his commandments? Don't you know that you're wrong? You can be made right. You can be made right with God so that you would stand before God and there would be no reason to be afraid, no terror, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That can be yours. All you have to do is believe in Jesus. And if you have believed in Jesus, church, my brothers and sisters, don't ever forget this. When God looks at you, he does not see your sin because of Jesus. When God looks at you, there is no reason to fear his condemnation. There's no reason to be afraid. Even those things that you are condemning yourself for, God does not hold that against you. It has already been paid for on the cross. There, God sees no sin when he looks at you because of Jesus Christ. So how dare we see sin in other people? How dare we judge other people for their little faults, for their little imperfections? You are holding that person to a standard that God no longer holds you to. You are being more judging than God. How dare we do that? I mean, do you even get it? Wouldn't we judge others? Do you even understand what God has done for you? All of the ways that you have sinned against God, all of the reasons that God could find to hold you at fault, and yet he has forgiven you. He treats you with grace and mercy. Oh, how dare we look at others with judgment. This is the question that Jesus starts asking in verses 3 through 5. He says, why do you see the speck that's in your brother's eye, but you don't notice the log that's in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take this speck out of your eye when there's this log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you'll see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. This is really meant to be a very funny illustration. We often think about Jesus, I think, as being kind of dour, you know, as, as very stern and serious. And, and he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, but I also think Jesus had a really good sense of humor. This is a funny picture. Jesus is saying, imagine your brother's over here, and, and he's got a speck of wood in his eye. He's got a, a piece of, of wood in his eye, and that hurts. Have you ever had that happen? Something flies up in your eye. He can't get it out. He's over here. He's got this. It hurts. It's sensitive. He needs help. This is what Jesus is saying in, in this illustration that he uses, that all of us have sin, and yes, we need help with them, especially eye surgery. I don't want to do that to myself. I need somebody else to come and help me get the sin out. God has put us together in a community to help one another with these weaknesses and these failings that we have, that we can remove them. And so you've got this guy over here, and he's got this, this thing in his eye, and it's hurting really bad. And then here you come, and you say, I'm going to help him, but you've got this 20-foot plank in your eye. And you're trying to get close to him. And it's like, you know, hold on, let me, get, let me get that. Let me get there. Come on. And you can't even get close. It's ridiculous. That's what Jesus is trying to say. First, get that big old plank out of your eye, and then you can help your brother. So what is Jesus saying about our sin with this illustration? Our own sin. Man, it's a big deal. We don't know exactly what maybe this, this plank is meant to be. Maybe, maybe it's meant to be just this idea that our pride and our hypocrisy is a really big deal. That our pride and our hypocrisy, no matter what they've got going on, if we're trying to help with pride and hypocrisy, that is like this giant log sticking out of your eye. Or maybe what Jesus is getting at here is that people who struggle with hypocrisy at times often struggle with much worse sins than whatever the people are that we're condemning. So it's like what Jesus says to the Pharisees, hey, you're really good at tithing dill and mint and cumin, but you're really bad at love and mercy and justice. Hey, you've got a much bigger problem than they have. Or what Jesus is just saying is that we should all prioritize our own sin much more than we prioritize dealing with the sins of other people. That we should deal first with our own sin. That we should prioritize introspection, not looking outward at other people and all of their problems, but we should just be self-suspicious. We should be looking first at what's going on in our own hearts. That we should be humble that we should be prioritizing confession, not fault-finding. 
think this is especially true if you're in a situation where you're having conflict with someone else, especially with another believer. I think this passage has a lot to do with conflict, okay, that there's a brother with some sin, there's somebody else, and they're trying to work through that or, or address that. I think there's a lot of parallels with Matthew chapter 18 that come out in, in this illustration. But if you're having a conflict with somebody else, if somebody else has sinned against you, like Matthew 18 says, well, rather than starting with their responsibility in the conflict, start with your responsibility. Even if you know that 90% of the problem is theirs, look at the 10% that is your own. Focus there. Start there. Start applying God's standard to yourself. And remember that if it were not for Christ, you would be completely condemned for that sin. And God has forgiven you everything. And then go to that brother or sister and confess that sin to them. Tell them, this is my fault. This is what I have done wrong, and I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Be specific about it. This is, this is my stuff. I want to just bring you, I'm focusing on my stuff. I want to bring that to you. Please forgive me. And then Jesus says, you'll see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. When you do that, when you do that work, you know that you've got the right heart. And you know that you're, you're addressing their sin according to the right standard. And a lot of times when you start, I mean, this is just totally practical stuff, okay? But when you start a conflict or try to resolve a conflict by starting with confessing your own sins, that usually makes the rest of it go a lot better. You guys know this. If you start with accusations, you start with condemnation, you start with judging, well, then you're just bringing that back on yourself. But if you start with humility and confession, usually that brings it about. That's how God has made the church to be reconciled. But we are judging, not hypocritically, but judging with a right heart and with a right standard. So that's our first point. Now let's turn to the second point. And this one's short. This is just one verse. Okay, so verse 6 says, Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. And this is probably the weirdest verse in the whole Sermon on the Mount. Who are these dogs? What are these pearls? And what on earth does this have to do with what just came before it and what comes after it? It has puzzled commentators for a long time. Some scholars think that this whole part of the Sermon on the Mount, starting in chapter 7, is really kind of just a random assortment of wisdom sayings that were sort of just thrown together in a jumbled mess at the end of the sermon. It's almost like um, the book of Proverbs, like the bulk of the book of Proverbs, which is just this totally random assortment of wisdom sayings that are all kind of pieced together. And there's actually something kind of cool in that because Solomon, who wrote the book of Proverbs, was Jesus' great, 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 you know, many great grandfather. So maybe Jesus is just being like his granddaddy here, and he's kind of throwing out Proverbs all over the place. Maybe. But I think if we look closely, there's actually more that these these different sections have to do with each other, that there's actually a train of thought here. And it is very much like wisdom literature that Jesus is giving to us, but, but it makes more sense if you look at it together. So, so if we remember, again, verses 1 through 5, I think those are cautioning us against exercising judgment hypocritically or exercising judgment pridefully. But then verse 6 is a counterbalance to all of that. So verse 6 is saying, okay, you, yes, you shouldn't judge hypocritically, you shouldn't be quick to judge, but you also shouldn't be naive. You also shouldn't just not judge anybody ever. You should also not just continue to extend grace and the gospel hope to people. There's a time where you do have to exercise judgment, where you do have to act uh, rightly in that way that you relate with other people, and you have to determine that some people are dogs or pigs that you should not have dealings with. In ancient Judea, dogs and pigs were both unclean animals. So dogs here does not refer to the dog that lives in your backyard. The, the dogs here refer to like street dogs that would run wild and they would scavenge and they would eat garbage all the time. And in the Jewish world, to call someone a dog was usually reserved, reserved for someone that was outside of the covenant community. This is especially Gentiles. They would call them dogs. Pigs, of course, uh, eating pigs was forbidden by the Mosaic Covenant, again, probably because they ate garbage and that they were considered to be unclean dogs. So Jews would not even, you know, raise pigs, that there were not pigs in uh, the land of Judea. So that's what Jesus is saying when he says pigs and dogs. And then he says, don't give what is holy to dogs or these holy things. In verse 6, that's probably a reference to holy food. 
So food that was consecrated for use in the temple. Probably the food that was reserved from the sacrifices that was to be given to the priests, okay? But this is holy, consecrated food that Jesus says, don't give that to dogs that are used to eating garbage. They won't know the difference. They're just as happy eating their garbage. Don't give them this consecrated special meat. And then he talks about pearls. Pearls, we all know what pearls are. Some of you probably have pearl necklaces on right now. In the Jewish world, uh, rabbis would often refer to pearls as good teaching. It's a really, really good teaching, especially teaching that they kind of strung together like pearls on a necklace. They would call good teaching pearls of wisdom. And then, of course, in uh, the Gospels, uh, Matthew 13, Jesus has a parable about a man that finds a really expensive pearl And he sells everything else that he has to get the pearl. And he says, that pearl is the kingdom of God. So what's the picture here that that Jesus is giving uh, to us? Is he saying that the pearls are the holy things. It's the gospel of the kingdom. It's the good news of the kingdom. And that we Christians should not continue to hold out the teaching, the good news of the kingdom to people who do not want it to people who prove that they hate it, to to people that reject it because they would rather go on eating their garbage. They don't appreciate the value of what it is that you are giving to them. I mean, think about uh, holding out a pearl to the pig and say, hey, piggy, look at how great this pearl is. They have no idea what you're talking about, but you know how valuable it is, but they don't get it at all. And Jesus says, don't continue to hold these things out to people who want nothing to do with it. So I think this can be in the context of church discipline. So again, in Matthew chapter 18, when someone refuses to listen even to the whole church's loving confrontation of their sin, then that person is removed from the covenant community. They are excluded from the benefits of this covenant promise because they have proven that they don't want it. And so you remove them. You you stop holding it out to them like it's something that they appreciate and value because they don't. And I think this also relates to the context of evangelism, when we're going out and we're sharing the gospel with people, that we should not continue to share the gospel with non-believers who reject it outright and want nothing to do with us. It's okay for us to say, you know what, this is not the time, that door is firmly closed, we're going to go on to somebody else. In Matthew chapter 10, Jesus sends the disciples out into all of the villages on an evangelistic mission. He sends them out and tells them to proclaim that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he tells them to go from village to village. And he says, if anyone refuses to listen to you, if anyone refuses to receive you, if a village says, get out of here, we don't want to hear what you have to say, then Jesus says that they are to shake off the dust from their feet as a sign of judgment and to leave that house or town. Just go on. There's other villages that will listen to what you have to say. Get out of that town. And then Jesus adds in verse 15 of Matthew 10, Truly I say to you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that day. You hear he's kind of bringing that end times judgment back to bear on this situation. So the the disciples are going to these people. They're offering the the good news of the kingdom, the good news of forgiveness and salvation, and salvation from judgment for their sins. And these people don't want to hear it. And I was just so struck by that this week about how sad that is, that you're going up to somebody and saying, do you want some pearls for free? And they say, get that out of here. I mean, it's just heartbreaking. But that is what happens. Jesus promised this in Matthew chapter 5 of the Beatitudes, that we will be reviled, we will be spoken evil of, we will be rejected on on account of Christ. And when that happens, Jesus tells you, you know what? Dust off your feet. Go to the next town. Don't waste any more time there because they don't get it. In fact, they might be mad at you because they just wanted to keep on eating their garbage and you're getting in their way. Let them go. So, of course, we read this and we ask, okay, how does that actually work out? When do we do this? When do we determine that, yeah, this person, they're just a pig or a dog? And it's meant to be not a condemnation from our own standard. It's meant to be a condemnation that God's saying they're not in the covenant. They're out because they haven't received this good news of the kingdom. But when do we make that determination? And you know what? If I had a a whole sermon to preach on this one verse, maybe we could get close to having some kind of principles or guidelines that we can apply here when we know is the time to dust off our feet and walk away. 
But we don't have time for that this morning. And I think before we rush to get too prescriptive about what Jesus is saying here, maybe let's just step back and look at the wisdom that he's giving to us. He just puts this out here. He doesn't give you guidelines. He doesn't tell you when they are or when they aren't. And, and he's saying, keep this intention with everything that came before it. Okay, don't judge people hypocritically. Don't judge them with the wrong heart. Don't judge them by the wrong standard. But don't put up, put up with them for too long because you might be wasting your time. And you say, well, Jesus, how do I know? What do we do? This is why we go to this next section. Verse 7. This is our third point. Ask, seek, and knock. Jesus says, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children... How much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask him? Now, this passage, too, you could stop and say, wait, what does this have to do with everything? These all seem totally disparate from each other. But I think, again, there's there's some wisdom here in how this is arranged. Now, in its most general sense, this section, verses 7 through 11, is just another beautiful teaching about prayer. And how we should pray in light of God's character. This is something that Jesus has been talking about a lot throughout the Sermon on the Mount so far. In the book of Luke, in Luke chapter 11, uh, the, the gospel writer there also cites this body of teaching. But he puts it in a place where it comes right after the Lord's Prayer. And then the parable about the friend at midnight. You remember that where the guy goes and bangs on the friend's door and asks for bread? And then he goes into this part. That whole thing makes a lot more sense. But still... Here, we see this main idea that Jesus has been unpacking through this whole sermon, that God is our Father. Jesus calls God our Father 17 times in the Sermon on the Mount. That God does love us, that God does know what we need before we ask, that we don't need to be anxious, we just need to pray for daily bread. And so Jesus is just undergirding that same argument here. He's giving us this beautiful teaching that we can go to God. We can go to God because God's like a father and an even better father than us earthly fathers. That's the argument, that even us earthly fathers, even the ones who really love their kids, by comparison to God, are evil. Because we don't do it quite right every single time. That we're not available 24-7 the way that God is. We don't have the kind of love that God has for us. And that's crazy for me to hear that, because I love my kids so much. And my kids can ask me for anything, can't they? When my little girl knocks on the door in the middle of the night because she had a bad dream, I will get up every single time. And God says, in my sin and in my weakness and in my failure as a dad, I'm evil by comparison to how good God is. So you can ask God for anything, anything that you need, daily provision, help, whatever it is. But we still ask, why didn't Matthew put this section here and not after the Lord's Prayer? Or not after the whole thing about being anxious. Why does he put it after this part about judging other people? Well, I think we, we're getting to that. That when you say, how do I make this right determination? When am I judging hypocritically? And when do I need to judge this person as a dog or a pig? How do I know? Well, you should ask God for wisdom. I think that's the main idea. The reason that Jesus puts this right here in this sermon is that as we go out trying to exercise right judgment in the world, we need a lot of God's help. And God will give us help when we ask. What does the Apostle James teach us? James chapter 1, verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without approach, and it will be given him. So when we're in these situations of trying to resolve conflict, of trying to interact with people, about trying to come to right judgments about people, we need to be praying a lot and asking God for wisdom. And God will give it. And I think this is a lot more important than we give, give credit to. Of course, we'll say, yeah, yeah, you should pray about that. But really, stop and think about this. How important is prayer when you are in conflict with somebody else, when there is some sin that needs to be addressed. How important is prayer? And yet, it's those situations that we seem to pray the least, that we seem to think a lot more about what we're going to say 
or about what's wrong with that person and how we want to fix it than about asking God for wisdom and help in that situation. I think there's such a connection between hypocrisy and prayerlessness. What an indicator that your heart is not in the right place when you're not praying. So we should be praying about our relationships with other people. We should especially be praying when there is conflict. And what should we be praying for? We'll go back to the speck and the plank. You should be praying that God would help you discern your own sins. Like Psalm 130, pray, God, show me my hidden faults. Show me if there be any grievous way in me that I can walk in the way everlasting. God, show me my sin. Help me see my planks. We should be praying that. And we should be praying for humility and compassion and mercy and love for this other person. God, help me have a right heart towards them. Not a judgmental heart towards them. And we should be praying for wisdom. God, when do I speak? What do I say? God, help me discern what I should say here. And I think we should pray for that person and their sin. There really is a speck in their eye. There really is some sin in their life. Have you prayed to God that he would help them with that? Have you asked God to take that out? Or do you think that's your job? Do you think you're the Holy Spirit and all you've been doing is thinking about what you're going to say to fix that person when you confront them? No, start by praying to God. I've even heard really good advice that you should set aside a set amount of time to pray for somebody in their sin before you confront them, like a month. Just pray every day for a month that God would help that person with their sin. You know what happens a lot of times is you realize that actually the sin was a lot more to do with you than it had anything to do with them. Or sometimes as you're praying for them over time and a few weeks go by, that person will come to you and confess that sin because God is alive. God works in other people's lives as much as he works in your life. So pray that God would be gracious and work in their life and pray. And even then, if you spent that amount of time praying for them and you finally go to confront them, well, then at least you'll know that you've got a right heart, that you're not acting out of judgment or anger or pride or any of these other things. So pray for that person in their sin. And then lastly, more than that, I think that we should go to our Father in heaven with confidence before his throne and pray that God would bless that person. Bless that person that you've been so tempted to judge. That God would do really, really good things in their life. Because that's not what we want when we're judging somebody else, isn't it? Usually when we're judging somebody else, what we want is to see them fail. What we want is for bad things to happen to them, for them to be punished. And we even get that sense of kind of satisfaction when something bad does happen to them. We're treating them like an enemy. We would want bad things to happen to them. No, we should pray for them and say, God, I want really good things to happen to that person, including their sanctification in this area of sin. But Lord, just bless them. Pour out your blessings on this person. Give them success at work. Give them success in their family. Lord, make really, really good things happen for this other person because I love them. It was Billy Graham that said, you cannot pray for someone and hate them at the same time. So again, this is all just that work of getting our hearts right before we go to somebody else. And I would ask, isn't that what you would want somebody else to be doing for you? And that's where we get to this last point. Verse 12, this is our fourth point. Jesus says, do also to others. So he says in verse 12, whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. So one more time, we could isolate this one verse out. We could consider it by itself. That would be a fine exercise to do, but I think Jesus has stuck it here for a a purpose, and I think you can see the progression, okay? Don't judge hypocritically, but also don't be naive. Sometimes you have to make judgments about people, and it's hard to know which, so you should be praying a lot, and if all else fails, treat other people the way that you would want them to treat you. That's the wisdom of this whole passage and how Jesus puts it together. And this is what we call the golden rule, right? Treat others the way that you want to be treated. This is kind of a universal idea. This same idea, the same thought of treating other people the way that you want to be treated, this has emerged independently in cultures and religions all over the world. It's quite fascinating. Buddhism, Confucianism, Zoroastrianism, Plato, Seneca, all of these people had very, very similar ideas. And then even Jesus is getting this idea from the Old Testament of the Levitical law that says, love your neighbor as yourself. 
So we all get that this is a good principle. It, it, it's out there. God has made us with this sense that this is, this is what is morally right, that you treat other people the way that you want to be treated. What's really fascinating to me is that when you study these other cultures and how they articulate the golden rule, almost without exception, okay, especially the, the older ones like Buddhism and Hinduism and these other ones, they always state it in the negative. So they always say, don't do to other people what you wouldn't want them to do to you. But Jesus, the Judeo-Christian tradition, states it positively. Do for other people what you, what you would want them to do for you. Do you hear the difference in that? All of these other religions, when they've arrived at their idea of the golden rule, they basically say, hey, you know what? Just leave each other alone. Stay out of each other's lives. Don't do something that you wouldn't want somebody to do to you, okay? Just leave each other alone. But what is Jesus' wisdom? What is Jesus' golden rule? Get in each other's lives and love each other. Get in each other's lives and bless each other. Get in each other's lives and do good for one another, even if that good is helping them see sin in themselves. Because wouldn't you want that? Would you just want to continue walking in some error or some sin that somebody else is seeing and they're not helping you with it? No. Jesus says, love others as you would want to be loved. And he says at the end of verse 12 that this command is the law and the prophets. That's amazing. Paul says something very similar in Galatians 5. The whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus is saying that you could boil down the whole of God's revelation about how we are to live in this world with this one idea. Do for others what you would want them to do for you. And we always say this when we think about the golden rule. You know, they always teach this to little kids in elementary school. They just say, you know what? If the whole world would just do this then everything would be better, right? And what's the problem? People don't do this. That's why there's problems in the world, that people do not treat others the way that they would want to be treated. That is what is wrong with the world. Jesus is holding it out to us here just like these other religions are. But the absolutely amazing thing about Jesus and the amazing thing about the Sermon on the Mount is that Jesus holds out this command for us this ethic for how we are supposed to love each other, treat others the way that you would want to be treated. And if we're really reading the Sermon on the Mount and we hear Jesus say that, he says, hey, just be nice to each other. If we're reading the Sermon on the Mount with a poor spirit, if we're reading the Sermon on the Mount with a spirit that mourns our own sin and hungers and thirsts for righteousness, and we hear Jesus say, treat others the way that you would want to be treated, we would just confess, I haven't done that. And as hard as I try, I can't do that. There are so many times when I'm selfish. There are so many times when I'm wrong. There's so many times where I fail to do that. And we realize, Jesus, I'm what's wrong with the world. And I think this is the point that every other religion comes to. Except their answer is, you know, so just try harder. Try harder to be nice. Try harder to be more loving. Try harder. But Jesus comes and he says, don't try harder. Let me do it for you. I will love in a way that is so beyond comprehension, that is so counter to what you have ever experienced. I will love you the way that you have always wanted to be loved. I will love you by giving everything for you so that you can have all that you need met in me. And so the Sermon on the Mount brings us to the end of ourselves, and it brings us to the point of realizing that God has provided everything for us in Jesus Christ, but it doesn't stop there. So when we read this command and Jesus says, love others, do unto others what you would want them to do to you, now we know that if we are in Christ, we can. We can and we must. So that's the difference between Christianity and all the other religions. They diagnose the problem the same way that we do, but they have no solution. But we have the spirit of Christ. Even this law Jesus has fulfilled for us. And so we do go in this spirit, not judging others hypocritically, relying on God's wisdom in these difficult situations, and trusting him for his righteousness, loving others because he loved us first. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this wisdom. And we pray that you would help us to walk in it. We pray that we would rely on your spirit, not on ourselves, that you would help us to love others the way that you have loved us. 
the way that we would want to be treated, the way that you have treated us. God, I pray that uh, if there's anyone in here in our church, brothers or sisters in our church who are in conflict with each other, God, that you would bring about resolution, that you would help them to see the planks in their own eye and bring about reconciliation. Help them to love each other in Christ. Lord, if there's anyone in here who has been outside of the covenant community, they haven't received this good news of the kingdom, Lord, I pray that you would help them to understand how valuable it is, this amazing gospel of forgiveness and grace, of approaching you with confidence like a father. And Lord, I pray that you would save them. And I pray that you would help us all to live rightly in this world, to live wisely in this world, that we would be a witness to your grace until you come again. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let us stand to respond to sing of his amazing love for us. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? Died he for me who called.
Yes, amen. That is amazing love, right? That God has loved us in Christ. No condemnation that we dread. If you're here and this, this isn't amazing love to you yet, please, let's keep on talking about it. Let us explain it to you. Let us show you these pearls of the good news of the kingdom that you can approach the throne of God with confidence that all of your sins would be forgiven. Please don't leave this morning without talking to whoever you came with. We'll have pastors up here at the front or, or just talk to somebody that was singing really loudly about this gospel and ask them, what is it? We will set up a coffee with you. We will email with you. Whatever it is, we want to explain this to you. Please don't reject this. Come closer, come in, come study this. If you are visiting with us and you're not a member of our church, if you're not a member of any church, let me remind you that we've got our newcomers reception today. The primary reason, one of the primary reasons that this church exists is so that we can be a community that loves each other, that we can extend this love to each other, even the kind of love that would call out somebody else in their sin, in grace and humility and patience. And so if you don't have a church home, come to this newcomer's reception. Go get your kids and then... Walk down the hall, you'll follow these signs, you'll see it looks just like that. Be in there, find out how you can join our church or join another faithful gospel preaching church in our city. But, but please come, if you don't belong to any church, come to our newcomers reception. And members of Desert Springs Church, let me leave you with this encouragement from God's word. Go out into the world this morning, believing that this is true, that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. You're dismissed.